Thus, a respectable person like Maharaj Yudhisthir had to leave all family connection for self-realization and going back to Godhead. No king or respectable gentleman would continue family life till the end, because that was considered suicidal and against the interest of the perfection of human life. In order to free, to be free from all family encumbrances and devote oneself cent per cent in the devotional service of Lord Krishna, this system is always recommended for everyone because it is the path of authority. The Lord instructs in the Bhagavad Gita that one must become a devotee of the Lord at least at the last stage of one's life. A sincere soul of the Lord like Maharaj Yudhisthira must abide by this instruction of the Lord for his own interest. The specific words of Brahma Parama indicate Lord Sri Krishna. This is corroborated in the Bhagavad Gita by Arjuna with reference to great authorities like Asita, Devala, Narada and Vyasa. Thus, Maharaj Yudhisthira, while leaving home for the north, constantly remembered Lord Sri Krishna within himself, following in the footsteps of his forefathers as well as the great devotees of all time. Translation, he then started towards the north, treading the path accepted by his forefathers and great men to devote himself completely to the thought of the Supreme Personality of Godhead, and he lived in that way wherever he went. So this is a nice description of the uh, departure of uh, Yudhisthira Maharaj, or formerly the king. Uh, we've heard the mentality with which he left and the uh, appearance of him when he renounced everything and that whole process of dissociating himself from the material body by merging the lower elements into the higher elements and then discarding the material body. So this is a, uh, as Prabhupada mentions in the purport, uh, this was customary. And as said in the verse itself, uh, this was the uh, path followed previously, Gatapurvam, previously others also followed the same path. Uh, doesn't necessarily mean they all went to the north, but at least they uh, renounced. And they renounced after completing their household life. So that was the system we see for the great kings. And uh, we find further examples in the Bhagavatam, like Bar Maharaj and others once they had uh, placed their uh, heirs on the throne, their sons, on the throne and they saw that the kingdom was handled properly, then they left the house. And they actually did great austerities, uh, extreme austerities. Uh, if we look at the, just the, the uh, descriptions uh, in the uh, Smriti Shastras, in the Puranas, we'll see that uh, the Vanaprastha life is very severe. Uh, very, very strict. Uh, and one leaves the household life and then one rejects clothing and one takes bark from a tree and one wears the bark of a tree. <laughs> and uh, one lives in the forest and one sleeps on the ground and one uh, digs up roots from the forest and takes fruit and one survives on that. Uh, uh, and uh, in this way one uh, practices austerity, great austerities for many years. So that's not even a sannyasi, that's just the vanaprastha who's preparing himself so later on he can take sannyas. Uh, so it's, uh, it's often said that uh, you know, brahmachari life is a preparation in which he learns austerity also. So he's in the gurukul and he sleeps on the floor, he goes out and he gathers wood for the sacrificial fires every day. He does not eat until the Guru gives him permission, and then he studies all day. Uh, uh, so he leaves and he doesn't wear shoes, doesn't use an umbrella, doesn't wear perfumes, uh, lives, uh, dresses very simply, etc. So he has a very austere life. And at the same time he's studying the Vedas. 
to get uh, spiritual knowledge. Okay. But uh, the, mm, let's say the, the system and ultimately the Supreme Lord realizes it's not everyone that's going to keep up that life as a brahmachari. Uh, most will get married, most people in life will get married and it's impossible for them to continue in that position of being a brahmachari. So most of them get married. So after uh, the tradition is after studying at the Guru Kul, then you go home and then you get married. Uh, it may be when you're 20 years old or 25 years or whatever, so you get married. Of course, there are exceptions, so it allows uh, for a, a, a brahmachari to continue that uh, life of a brahmachari throughout his life. So he's called a, a brihad brahmachari, a, a great brahmachari. He goes throughout his life as a brahmachari. But that's an exception. And the normal person uh, takes up household life. And then he raises a family until he is 50 years old. Which means if he graduates when he's 25, then uh, he should raise his family and then his children are grown up. <laughs> uh, they're like 20 years old or whatever when uh, he leaves the house or whatever. So uh, that was the system. Uh, because they realize that not everyone is going to be completely roused, therefore let everyone take household life, but then they should start renouncing again. So they take vanaprastha, which means literally go off to the forest. <laughs> so they go off to the forest, but it's not complete renunciation because the husband can take his wife at least, but he cannot have the children. So he goes without the children and he lives very austerely in the forest. Uh, so the, uh, the uh, brahmacharya life is a life of study and austerity. The uh, grihastha life is a life of enjoying and raising family. Uh, and the vanaprastha life is to counteract that. So you do a lot of austerities uh, without the family members. And then the last stage would be sannyas, where one completely renounces. And then one can fully dedicate oneself to worship of the Lord and meditation on the Lord. So in other words, the Vana Prasa stage is a, a, a preparation for a complete absorption in the Lord and sannyas. Uh, so that was the traditional system uh, of uh, the ashramas. Uh, and uh, th we see that uh, the um, the ashrama system cannot be separated from the varnas. Those who are qualified are qualified for the ashramas. So the students are not qualified for study because they don't have intelligence and they're lazy. So therefore they don't study the Vedas. So they don't become brahmacharis. So they become grihastas. <laughs> but because they haven't had a brahmachari life, they also can't renounce, so they don't have vanaprastha or sannyas. <laughs> There's one ashram for the sudras, which is the majority of the population in any civilization. So that was traditional system. Uh, and then the um, Vaishyas and Kshatriyas, they are allowed to study the Vedas, so they can be brahmacharis, uh, but not so popular. <laughs> So, uh, but they're allowed to study the Vedas to some degree, get some spiritual education. Uh, and then they get married. And they become the main, um, you say, the uh, main sustainers of the Varnashram system in one sense because we have the managers and we have the people producing the money, <laughs> uh, the, the Vaishyas. Eh? Of course, we can say the sudras are the labor, the instrument, but they don't have the brains to organize things properly and make things very productive. So it's up to the Vaishyas and the Kshatriyas to make it more proper so that the civilization can go on uh, and prosper. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, therefore, the, they, they take care of the Vaishyas and Kshatriyas, take care of the maintenance of the society. Uh, and they're householders. Uh, but the Varnashram system doesn't work unless it has a spiritual basis, unless there is a foundation of renunciation. So therefore it is said that the system consists of four goals, Arta, Dharma, Kama and Moksha. 
the ultimate goal is to renounce everything. <laughs> so though they're not really qualified for renunciation, the Vaishyas and Kshatriyas are, uh, get that hope that they should at least do that. Uh, uh, and uh, to help them, then they also become brahmacharis for a little while. And then they're allowed to renounce a little by taking vanaprastha. So, but because they're still affected by the modes of material nature, therefore they're not allowed to take sannyas. Mm. So that's the general system. And the brahmanas who are detached by nature, then they go through all four of the ashramas, uh, ending in sannyas. So that's the ideal system. Uh, in any society, of course, the majority are sudras, then there's less vaishas and less kshatris, and ultimately less brahmanas. And then ultimately there's least sannyasis, <laughs> because among the brahmanas all don't take sannyasa also. Uh, so, uh, therefore the, the sannyasis are very few, and maybe there's some vanaprastas among the three upper castes, but um, the renounced are much less than those who are engaged in society. Yeah. Uh, so the whole goal was ultimately that renunciation. If the uh, society loses that goal, then it does not function properly. Uh, the kings, if they don't renounce and have a goal of renouncing, they become too attached. And therefore, uh, they become selfish and uh, they're more capable of exploitation of the citizens. Okay. So this uh, system had a, a very good purpose, not just uh, uh, to have people renounce, but actually it was uh, help the rulers rule properly and not get too attached to their positions and to their uh, properties and their enjoyment. Uh, uh, so this we see um, in the example of Yudhisthira Maharaj. He was uh, not attached and he was very willing to renounce. One, because he's a Nitya Siddha, he's not attached to anything. Second, because he wants to set an example of uh, being detached as a uh, devotee of the Lord. Uh, ultimately, his real desire is simply to worship and remember the Supreme Lord at all times. And if he's involved in management, it's a little bit of a distraction. So therefore, when, uh, of course, Krishna told him you have to manage, so he managed. <laughs> when Krishna disappeared, they said, okay, if the order is finished, I can also renounce and simply remember the Lord. So, another reason. And, the, of course, he has to get a, set a good example for future leaders. They should also be detached and not uh, uh, possessive of their position and uh, their wealth and their enjoyment. So, uh, then he sets a good example for others. Uh, and, of course, he's following the tradition uh, according to scripture and according to previous examples. Uh, all the previous people did something similar. We see even Dhritarashtra, though he wasn't the king, but he wanted to <laughs> rule somehow or have a position. Ultimately, he gave up uh, living in the house of the Pandavas and walk, walked off to the forest also. Uh, so, uh, and of course we have so many previous examples in the Bhagavatam of persons who renounced everything. So, uh, this was a common practice among the uh, kings to, uh, at a certain stage, become vanaprastha and go to the forest. Uh, so, uh, he had, uh, he followed this example also. Uh, and, of course, as I mentioned before, he had the signs of renunciation internally and externally. But, the main purpose is Brahmapuram Jaya, meditation on the Supreme Lord, thinking of the Supreme Lord at all times. Yeah. And so, uh, Jnana means meditation, and uh, Smarna means remembering, so the Jnana is a more intense form of remembering. Uh, uh, we concentrate on the Supreme Lord more and more. Uh, Though, of course, we can say uh, impersonal, so say, ah, Supreme Brahman, meditation on the impersonal. <laughs> but we usually distinguish these two. Brahman, of course, can mean regular impersonal Brahman. Uh, uh, of course, it can also mean Supreme Lord, uh, because uh, we know in the 
Vedanta Sutras, for instance, the first sutra is Atato Brahma Jigatha. Now you should inquire about Brahman. So then the question comes, well, what is that Brahman? So the second sutra is Janmadasa Yataha. The supreme uh, Brahman is that substance or entity from which creation, maintenance, and destruction take place. Uh, so, uh, our Acharyas say this means Supreme Lord, Bhagavan. Uh, not only our Acharyas, I think Nimbark also says uh, uh, Brahman means Krishna. That's <laughs> his first statement. <laughs> So, uh, in other words, it's not just Gaudiyas are fanatical and they do this, but all the Vaishnava Acharyas say Brahman means Supreme Lord, ultimately. Uh, uh, and of course that's defined by that second sutra, he, f he or that from which everything arises. So what does everything arise from? If it is Shankaracharya's Brahman, it gives rise to nothing because everything is illusion. So there is no creation, there is no destruction ultimately. So it cannot be the impersonal Brahman of Shankaracharya, definitely not. <laughs> uh, others could argue, of course, okay, we, don't, we believe in a real world, but we also believe in impersonal Brahman. Yeah. Uh, but then it cannot be really impersonal, because to manifest a world full of qualities and stuff, that Brahman also has to have some sort of potential for qualities. There has to be something in that Brahman that creates a world that we can see that has color, that has activity, that has qualities. So it can't come from nothing or a substance with nothing. Uh, there has to be that uh, potential quality within Brahman itself. And therefore he's not just something, a mass of uh, uh, impersonalism. <laughs> and to create, somehow create the material world, he has to have desire, a willpower, a shakti to do some action. So he cannot simply be Brahman with nothing, so he has to be a Brahman with Shaktis. <laughs> and then we get a person ultimately out of that. Hmm. So therefore even the word Brahman means a, a personal God according to our Vaishnava Charis, not only Gaudiyas but others as well. Uh, and uh, though sometimes we use that word to indicate the impersonal Brahman, when we put the word param with it, which means supreme, okay, we often use that to indicate the source of that Brahman. Okay. So we have Bhagavan, Paramatma and Brahman all being one entity. But they're not all equal. The Brahman is simply a feature of Bhagavan. It belongs to him. So it's not independent of him, and it's dependent upon Bhagavan. So then if we talk about a supreme Brahman, it cannot be that Brahman which is dependent. It has to mean the origin of that Brahman, which is Supreme Lord. Just as we have the sun and its rays. So the sun is the source, the rays are the product. So we often call Brahman like the sun rays. Uh, because in one sense it, uh, the, the rays, the light has no particular form, whereas the sun has a form. So, But this, the, the rays are like the sun, but they're also a little distinct because they don't have a form and they're dependent upon the sun. If the sun does not exist, the rays don't exist. So there's Bhagavan and there's his rays or effulgence called the Brahman. Uh, and the, the Brahman is dependent on him. And the original source the sun has form. Uh, so therefore, Param Brahma will refer to Supreme Lord. And then we have a further expansion on that. Uh, uh, we talk about Param Brahma meaning Bhagavan, and then we have uh, the Param Brahma in human form, Nara Akriti, uh, which is described in the Vishnu Purana. So who is that? That is Krishna. So he's Supreme Brahman who takes a very human-like form. Uh, not just the form, but his qualities, his activities become very human. And he doesn't project himself as being greater than anyone else. Uh, so that means Krishna. Uh, so uh, Param Brahma in the human form is Krishna. Mm. So in any case, um, Yudhisthira 
meditated on Supreme Lord and ultimately on the form of Krishna because he was a devotee of Krishna. Uh, in fact, he only involved himself along with the Pandavas in the war because of Krishna. <laughs> Krishna said, do it, so they did it. Uh, so, and they also understood Krishna is that Supreme Brahman. He is Supreme. He is the Lord. As we see in Bhagavad Gita, uh, uh, Arjuna surrenders to Krishna and does whatever he says. Uh, so they accept him. Uh. So, therefore, ultimately, um, Yudhisthira, though he was uh, practicing renunciation, uh, his main goal was simply think of the Lord all the time and think of Krishna. So it was not an impersonal renunciation at all. Uh, it was only uh, a function. The renunciation was a function of his devotion to the Lord, Bhakti. Yeah. So it was a secondary feature, as I mentioned the other day, all his ragged hair and his clothing. That was a secondary feature of his uh, meditation on the Lord. But he was simultaneously following the system of the previous uh, great kings, right? Uh, taking Vanaprastha and renouncing him, or taking up the dress of a Vanaprastha, etc. And going off towards the north. Uh, so in this way, uh, he uh, did everything. And uh, wherever he went, it says here in the verse, he lived that way wherever he went. So, in other words, he was completely steady in his uh, meditation on the Supreme Lord. He did not deviate at all. So he was highly qualified for this uh, ashram. Uh, as we see, of course, he is Nita Siddha, so there's no question of his qualification, but uh, as a uh, setting an example for other, other people, and then um, he fulfilled his duties as a a proper renunciate and uh, uh, went off with great determination. So we see in this um, simultaneous Yudhisthira is following the Varnashram system because he is the king and as Bhagavad Gita says whatever the great man does others follow so therefore particularly the kings are obliged to set a good example for others. So therefore they should follow the system so that other people also follow after that and do it. Yeah. Unfortunately, we know in Kali Yuga we don't have any great king now, so there's nobody to follow, <laughs> so nobody's really inspired to renounce. <laughs> but we see even in the time, let's say, of, um, let's say, over the last thousand years, gradually this whole system has decayed, and we don't find that many people who even become Vanaprastas, or just become sannyasis. And we don't find many people who become brahmacharis even. <laughs> even though they may be brahmins or kshatriyas or vaishyas, very, very few become brahmacharis. Yeah? So that has been the trend over the last uh, so many years, maybe 500 years or so, you know? So it's a rather um, sad situation with the um, disintegration of that system over time. Uh, so that, of course, is also a result of Kali Yuga. Uh, as Kali Yuga progresses, uh, we see that Dharma uh, gets weaker and weaker, so therefore uh, the Varnashram system also will tend to disintegrate, and uh, the uh, uh, divisions get mixed up, the ashramas get destroyed, and nobody follows anymore. So that's the position of the modern world, <laughs> uh, nobody following anymore. So, uh, in spite of that, we do have one hope, uh, and that is, whatever the condition, bhakti survives and can be practiced. So even if you don't have the system, at least we do bhakti, at least we have Nam Sankirtan. Right? So the Kali Yuga may be an ocean of faults, but at least uh, the one good quality is the Nam Sankirtan. So we can go on with that in any case. Uh, but, uh, on the other hand, to uh, preach effectively uh, and on a larger scale, we do have to have some sort of system for society. 
We have to give some sort of system for the people to follow internally, of course, as part of our society, and hopefully for the rest of society. So, it will definitely have to have some, um, be a little reflection of the original Varnashram system that we cannot do it perfectly. At least we can take some of those elements and try to implement them in order that society goes on nicely and within ISKCON also uh, things go on harmoniously as far as social interactions are concerned. Um, so, uh, we have the two elements there, uh, the devotional service and then some sort of a social structure to keep things, um, let's say, regular and predictable for us, so, or stable, we can say. Uh, and in this way we can uh, go on functioning as the Kali Yuga with our devotion. Okay, any question? No, so, to, um, uh, for someone to become a devotee or a brahmachari or sannyas renunciant like that, is that something that's going to show up in their astrology or is it free will or is it like a, a, like destined to happen? Uh, that? Well, yeah, the, the, the ashrams themselves are related to the varnas <laughs> and traditionally, of course, you could predict varna from a horoscope because, uh, you know, we have gunas there also, uh, you know, sattva gun, raja gun, tamago and, and we have uh, varnas, uh, certain uh, ascendants are related to varnas, certain planets are related to qualities like uh, obviously Mars is, is not a sattvic planet, it's very passionate <laughs> and Saturn's considered very tamasic, you know, they're like this, so uh, uh, we have like kshatriya planets, Mars and Sun for instance and Brahminical planet is Jupiter, uh, so we do have uh, planets and signs and uh, houses uh, related to uh, the gunas and the varnas. However, in itself it may be a little difficult to predict because there's all sorts of weird combinations taking place in everybody where the planets may be in one place and the houses are different and the signs are different so we get mixtures. And then in Kali Yuga, the, 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 there's no real clear uh, distinctions anymore. The, the qualities are all mixed up. <laughs> So it's more difficult to tell he's what he may be three in one, you know, or four in one. Even <laughs> like this, a little bit of everything. So it becomes more difficult to predict uh, that, that even the varna, what to speak of the ashram, uh, in, in in the astrology because of that. Uh, but of course we have some, we can make some general predictions so that you know they're more passionate or they're more uh, philosophical minded. That we can say or whatever. But there may be a mixture there, so he could have maybe two varnas and constantly <laughs> the ashram will get affected by that as well. And there is of course predictions of more attachment and less attachment. So obviously less attachment then they're more qualified for sannyas and whatever, you know, you know, More attachment then more qualified for grihasa life. Yeah, he wanted he wanted to what, tell the truth, so to speak. So he didn't want to tell a lie. Uh, so that's uh, an example of uh, the the urge to be very dharmic and follow the example of dharma. Uh, on the other hand, we know it's ultimately he's the servant of the supreme lord. So we can say this may more well, it's a lila, huh? and uh, we see that um, because he hesitated. <laughs> Uh, is it going to be proper or not, and he should follow the Lord or not, then he, had, he apparently suffered for that. But I, we can take it all as Leela, the Supreme Lord, ultimately. Uh, but what it illustrates is the order of the Lord is, in other words, we have um, orders in Scripture given for Karma Yoga, and we're not, that's the regular system. And then we have a little higher order for Jnana, for people who are qualified then they have to follow a different order. Instead of engaging in your activities, it says renounce your activities. So that's, if a person is qualified, then we have to follow the higher order. But then higher than that is bhakti. If the Lord says do it uh, and it's a devotion, then we do that instead of jnana, the order from jnana or the order from karma. 
So in other words, if Krishna says do it, then we, we're considering dharma or jnana. No, it doesn't reply anymore. <laughs> when Krishna says do, we do it. Yeah? So in other words, we have orders on three levels, and the highest is bhakti, Supreme Lord. It could apply to either, because we see previously this uh, the idea of merging the different elements, that's actually part of the Astanga Yoga system as well. But often we see this word meditate in the heart, or think in your mind, or think in your heart, it's a common phrase just to um, uh, relate the, the thinking to the mind or the heart. In other words, it's a mental thing, not an uh, external sense activity. So internally, in other words, he meditated on uh, the Supreme Lord. The other significance, of course, is that uh, we use the heart to indicate devotion as well. Mm -hmm. So we say that the definition of bhava was to manifest in the heart the stai bhava. <laughs> huh? So in the heart, well, what do we mean by the heart? It's not the physical heart, obviously. Huh? So obviously it means the atma, in the, in the jiva, within the jiva, who's devotional. So in that sense, the devotional heart is the jiva, we can say. Of course, we can say that the jiva itself develops a spiritual heart as well. Uh, so that's where the, the devotion lies. So um, it also implies in this particular case, when if, he, if we say he's meditating on Krishna, that in the heart means it's with great devotion. <laughs> in terms of yoga, of course, the heart chakra is the... Uh, well, of course, it has to do with unconditional love as well. So. But that's maybe a lesser type of thing for the yogis. But for us, then heart means prema. <laughs> Okay. Hare Krishna.